He tells us that the heart of the Buddha's awakening was discovering the principle of causality, how cause and effect work to shape your experience. It sounds pretty abstract, but it's actually very directly related to what you're experiencing right now. In other words, as the result of past karma, there is your present karma and the result of present karma. Those are the three things you're experiencing. Of course, for all of us, when we start out, it all tends to be mixed together. There's just experience. We don't see these patterns. We don't see the component factors. And so things seem pretty random. But if you learn how to look at what you're doing right now, you get a much greater sense that you're not totally passive. The things you experience are not just things coming in at you, but there's an active side to the mind that goes out and shapes them. It adds a little here, takes away a little bit there. And it's getting sensitive to that, that aspect of the mind, what you're doing right now. That's a lot of the insight you need to gain in a meditation. Most of us are like someone who goes into a room and we may storm into the room and act in a certain way and then complain later, well, the people in the room seemed awfully defensive, they seemed awfully unfriendly, as if you didn't have any impact on the atmosphere of the room through your actions or the way you entered the room. So how are you storming into the present moment? One way to find out is by checking on the breath. Exactly what are you doing with the breath right now? Is, it, is the breathing a totally passive, automatic process, or are you doing something to the breath? Is there some level of mind that's making decisions? One way to find out is to make conscious decisions about the breath. Nudging it a little bit here, a little bit there. These are, We're not talking about huge differences in the breath, just making gradual, gradual changes in whatever direction seems more and more and more comfortable. Then you begin to realize that your present experience of pleasure or pain it depends on decisions you're making right now. You begin to get more sensitive to what the mind is doing, particularly in terms of its perceptions and its thought constructs, how these relate to your feelings. Perceptions, those are the labels you put on things. You sit here having experience of the body, breathing in, breathing out. You can change that perception. You say everything you sense of the body right now has something to do with the breath property, so it's connected to the breath in one way or another. Look at it that way. See what that does to your sensation of the body, the way you relate to it, the way you breathe. And then your thought constructs. You say, well, how about breathing this way? How about breathing that way? And so you give it a try. And as you do this, you get a greater and greater sense of how much you really are shaping your present experience. Then you can take this insight and you can apply it to issues of pain, both physical pain and mental pain. Again, most of us tend to think of ourselves as just passive recipients of a particular pain that comes in at us and there doesn't seem much we can do about it. A lot of that is because we have a habitual way of reacting to pain. And unless we can change that habit, we're not going to see much improvement in the issue of why we're suffering, how we suffer. But if you take a physical pain, you realize, okay, part of it is that there is something wrong with the body. But there's also something that the mind is doing in the way it experiences pain, the way it paints a mental picture of the pain to itself, the way it latches on to that mental picture. what it's doing to maintain the pain in a particular way, or to move it in a particular direction. That's going on all the time, and yet we're not really aware of it, how much we're contributing to our own pain. That's the big issue. That's first noble truth, the pain that we're creating through our clinging and craving. And so in order to see that, you have to be very, very sensitive to this present moment and very sensitive to what your input is. This is why concentration is so important, getting the mind really still so that it can see these things very precisely. For instance, when pain arises, 
we tend to miss the fact that the mind is constantly labeling it pain, 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 pain. In addition to the label of pain, there's sometimes we paint a picture of it to ourselves. Well, just that act of labeling contributes many times to the pain, if there's clinging that goes along with it. And when you get really sensitive to the movements of the mind, and a lot of this requires getting the breath really still, so it's not interfering with what you see. When you see the movements of the mind, you see that this is constant repetition going on in the mind. The clinging, sometimes the clinging and the repetition, the, the labeling are so insistent that actually the physical cause of the pain is long since gone, but the clinging, the act of clinging, that's the pain you're experiencing now. So when you learn how to see, oh, there's that mental label going again, there it goes again, there it goes again. Can you stop it? See what happens when that, when you stop it, when you just drop it. And then you find that your experience of the pain changes. That's when you really get insight to the, into this issue of what you're doing in the present moment, how you contribute to the shape of your experience. So that's a lot of the meditation right there. Just getting the mind sensitive to what it's doing. All too often that's our big blind spot is what we're doing right now. We're so conscious of what other people are doing. They did this to me. They did that to me. Without, being, without looking at, well, what are you doing? So that what they've done to you is causing the mind pain. Because many times you can't avoid what's happening to you from the outside, it's past karma, but you can avoid the way you're reacting to it. And sometimes you find that the way you're reacting to it is, is actually contributing an awful lot to what those other people are doing, or what the situation is doing. But even when that's not the case, you find that whatever the pain and suffering is, it's your relationship to it that's causing the mind to suffer. That's what the noble, first noble truth is all about, clinging to the five aggregates. Clinging to your feelings, clinging to your perceptions, clinging to your thought constructs, to the body, to form, as they say, or to consciousness. When you stop the clinging, okay, even though those things are still impermanent and there still may be some stress there, it doesn't weigh on the mind. The bridge has been cut, so it doesn't connect. You stop lifting things up, and that is in that image of a John, so what? The mountain may be heavy in and of itself, but if you're not trying to lift it up, it's not heavy for you. So you've got to see where you're doing your heavy lifting. And then to try to understand why. It's only when you understand why you're doing things, because, oh, I misunderstood that, misunderstood this. When you see why you're doing it, that's when you really stop. Sometimes in the course of the meditation you can force yourself to stop. But if there's no real understanding, as soon as the mind gets back to its old ways, that goes lifting things, carrying them around again. But if you look into, well, why are you lifting these things? What, what's the misunderstanding that's there? Why do you feel that you have to do this? That's a lot of it right there. It's an old habit, the way the mind contributes to the present moment in different ways, and particularly the ways that it causes itself unnecessary suffering. We think that's a necessary part of experience, but it's not. When you see there's stress, when you see there's a burden, and you realize it's not necessary, that's when you really let go. So one good check for the whole issue of exactly where is your clinging right now? Where are you contributing to unnecessary suffering? Try to make the mind as still as possible and stay there for a while and just observe, okay, is there still some stress here? Is there still a sense of burdensomeness right here? Okay, what else is going along with that? Can you see any activity, any intention that's going along with that stress? And then if you catch sight of it, okay, then you drop it. And it's almost invariably something you didn't realize you were doing, things that you were holding on to. Sometimes you're aware that you're holding on, but you think you've got to hold on. Say, this is the core of my being, this is who I am, this is the way I, my mind has to work. Well, it doesn't have to work. Learn how to question those assumptions. Learn how to let 
let go a little bit. Then you see that it loosens things up in the mind, and things that you didn't see before you suddenly see. This burden that you create for yourself is totally unnecessary, which you thought was just a necessary way of things had to be this way. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. That's what the whole message of the Buddha's awakening is. That principle of causality we talked about, he applied it to discover, okay, the suffering that the mind feels in the present moment is not necessary. That's why the principle of causality was so important. He realized what element he was putting in in the present moment that was creating that suffering, and he learned to stop. And so what happened when there was no input in the present moment? As we meditate, what we find is that our input gets more and more and more subtle. And oftentimes we're, we're not even aware of it. We tell ourselves, just, we're sitting here very peaceful, very calm, nothing's going on. Still, there's something going on in the mind. We're missing it. It's in a blind spot. So when you begin to see that blind spot and begin to let go of what's in there, that's when things open up. That's when the meditation can really start making a radical change in the mind. A lot of the relationships in your mind that you thought, this is that way and that's this way, you begin to realize it's not necessarily. And that realization that it's not necessary, that's where the liberation lies. So there's a continuity, continuity throughout the whole process of meditation, even from the very beginning, just sitting here. As soon as the mind slips off, just bring it right back. Slips it off again, bring it right back again. Okay, be, it's making you more conscious of what you're doing in the present moment. You get more conscious of how the mind has these, these blank spots, these blind spots within it. And you learn to make them more and more and more subtle, less dominant in the mind. In other words, you try to cut through them as much as you can. What happens, of course, is they get more subtle. But you get more and more measure of control over the mind, and a greater sense of what you're doing in the present moment. That's crucial to the meditation. And then you take that principle and you keep applying it in more subtle levels. It's the same principle holds all the way through. Just that as you keep working on it, it requires more precision. But that's something you can develop. After all, this is a skill. That's another one of the Buddhist great discoveries. The ability to learn the path to liberation is a skill that people can master in the same way you master other skills. Looking at the results of your actions and reflecting back on what you did and trying to adjust things so they get more and more precise, more and more subtle, less burdensome to the mind. But awakening isn't something that's just going to comes to people without their awareness of what they're doing, or that it comes from outside. It requires that you get really sensitive to this, process, this teaching on karma. I am the owner of my actions. Okay, you're acting right now. So be very careful about what you do. In the same way that you'd be very careful about building a fire, you be careful about all the other skills that you need in life. It's just that you're more careful, more precise, it requires more subtlety. But this simple process of just getting more skillful in how you relate to the present moment, that can take you all the way to awakening. And that right there is revolutionary.